And welcome to this edition of Hidden History, Stories from the Secret City. I'm Keith McDaniel, along with my co-host, Ray Smith. Ray, uh, how are you today? I'm very good, Keith. How are you? I am good. And we have, you know, we always have great guests on, on our on our uh, podcast here, but today we have a very special guest. So why don't you introduce our guest today, Ray? Uh, we do. We have one of the best uh, and most authoritative sources for uh, the Manhattan Project history, plus many other. Richard Rhodes is with us today. And of course, he wrote the book in 1985, The Making of the Atomic Bomb. And he's since, well, he was writing before then, but he's written over 30 books and published. He's a, a Pulitzer Prize winning author. And, and we are fortunate to have him with us today. And, and I know that he, he'll talk to us about that book, but he's got so many other books that we're going to let him talk about some of the other things that he's doing, uh, even up to his most recent ones, if he wants to. So we're going to uh, we're going to leave it up to uh, up to you how you want to do this. But but I'll ask you to start by re recalling your visit to Oak Ridge uh, a few years ago and then. Why don't you back up to when you were writing that, fir that first book about the Manhattan Project and, and connect us to Oak Ridge there. Is that a good way to start? Sure, absolutely. Well, I'm having trouble remembering my recent visit. <laughs> I must have come down to give a talk. You, you did, and, and I'll, I'll help you there. It was probably three, four years ago. You and I were up in Washington, D.C., we were up there uh, for an event Cindy Kelly had put on with the Atomic Heritage Foundation. Right. And, and we got into a conversation there and, uh, uh, and I was talking to you about coming to Oak Ridge and, and you were trying to figure out how, how we could work it out. And then I happened to introduce you to this young lady, Leah Whit, who was the uh, communications director for or in the communications office for the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. And she had the nuclear week going on over in Knoxville. So she convinced you to come down and speak at that, uh, over in the Knoxville Convention Center at that, uh, at that nuclear week event. And I don't remember, it may have been four or five years ago. You know, time flies. No, I do but remember that, yeah. <laughs> Just have to have you have a better memory than I do, obviously. <laughs> I wouldn't say that. <laughs> well, let's go back to the first visit because the uh, K25 plant was still up. Yeah. It had not been torn down yet. And one of the first things that I remember from that visit was my guide taking me up to what must have been the head of the valley, up high and looking down on K-25, right. just being, as I'm sure everyone has been over the years, awed mm -hmm. by the sheer scale mm -hmm. of this plant where, where I'm told the supervisors used to travel around on bicycles <laughs> because, because the plant was, what was it, half what? a mile on yeah. a side? It, it was a half a mile on each leg. Yeah. And where they took you was up on Perimeter Road. There's an overlook up there. You just pull off the road and you're looking right down on the U shape of the building, looking at it from the north end, which is where, where it comes together. And you'd see the two wings running out down toward the south. And, and you're right, it was 44 acre building. So it was uh, the largest building in the world under one roof at the time it was built. So you yes. saw it in 1980s yeah. And uh, it, right. it did not get actually torn down completely until, oh, when was it, Keith? Back? Oh, in, it was in, well, six, seven years ago. Yeah, not, like not, too ago, yeah not too many years ago. Less than too many years ago. Yeah. And we well, tried desperately to save a section of yeah. that building. I mean, we struggled because it, it, it is a, a, a national treasure, it really oh, is. Yeah. The only, uh, the, it, it, because of its size, but because of what it did both for the Manhattan Project and for the Cold War, all of the highly enriched uranium that the nation has today came out of that building, that oh, really? 25 oh, building. 
but we weren't able to it the roof uh, leaked in they got a lot of mold and mildew and and actually when they were trying to disassemble the equipment to take it out of the building an individual fell 30 feet from the operating floor down through the other floors and he he survived but that got their attention and they said look we can't we can't continue like this we just have to demolish that thing and and it's gone so we've got a footprint of it there now yes and of course we've got a a k-25 history center that's yes. been created right down at the south end of where the footprint is and uh, and they're planning to build an interpretive center and Good. of course now the uh the that footprint is a part of the manhattan project national historical park exactly. along with the Calutron building at Y12 that remains, uh, building 9731, the other building that still has an Alpha Calutron, two Alpha Calutron magnets in it, amazing things. They're the only ones in the world. And then, of course, the graphite reactor, which is a, a National Historic Landmark itself. So all of those are part of the park now. Now, I'll, I'll let you go back to talking about what you well, saw. Let's, yeah, as long as we're talking about the, the calutrons, mm -hmm. there was a beta calutron still operating, I think, in the, yes. in the early 80s. Okay. It, it, it operated but, until 1998. Mm -hmm. I got to tour that. and. Yeah. And the usual experience of stepping across the magnet and having your foot twist because of the <laughs> nails in your shoe. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, but, but this is a chance to tell that amazing story of okay. General Groves' problem with having to make some big bus bars. Ah. I, I just recently learned that direct current can't be run on at high voltages on small wires. Mm. You need a large, massive, I think when Thomas Edison was thinking of putting an uh, electric uh, line up Fifth Avenue in New York at the turn of the 20th century, someone said, well, he'd have to, to, run, from, to run from Times Square to 59th Street, he'd have to have a bus bar the size of his leg in diameter. <laughs> so that was the scale of the electric current yeah carrying bus bars for those calutrons. Yeah, uh, let, me, let me interrupt just, just yeah. a second to tell you, that picture that uh, Ed Westcott made of the calutrons, the alphas, where you can look down on that oval shape, Yeah. what you see is that bus bar. That's right. in the middle that runs around that oval shape. And exactly. by the way, that was solid silver. Well, now that's the story I want to tell. All right. <laughs> You go ahead, don't let me steal it from you. <laughs> <laughs> I've got something in front of us here that keeps popping up just a moment. Okay. There. Okay. Uh, General Gross needed an enormous amount of metal mm -hmm. and copper was scarce. Yeah. I suspect it was being used for bullets among other things during the Second World War. But in any case, he had to think about, was there any other metal that he could get a large quantity of? and creative figure that he was, as you know, he decided, well, look, there's an enormous amount of silver at Fort Knox. It's just sitting there. Uh, silver is a great electrical conductor. We're gonna shut these things down after the war. We're not gonna keep these calutrons operating, he thought. <laughs> so <laughs> let's just borrow a bunch of coin silver from Fort Knox <laughs> and use that to make the bus bars for the Calutrons. So <laughs> when his man went up to Fort Knox, he told the man there that he wanted X number of tons of coin silver. And the, the famous story is that the, the uh, Fort Knox official said, uh, sir, we don't discuss our <laughs> coin silver in tons we discuss it in troy ounces <laughs> but they did in fact of course remove an enormous amount of coin silver use it to make the bus bars ran it during the war and after the war switched back to switched over yeah, to copper and Ray, Rose was oh, so meticulous in his accounting that he returned all the coin silver to fort knox and i think with just a few ounces actually missing in the process. 
<laughs> what happened there is that there was less than one tenth of one percent law. Oh. Oh. Now, if you take one tenth of one percent yes. of fourteen thousand seven hundred tons, <laughs> now that's a little bit more than just a little bit of silver <laughs> that we lost. <laughs> and, and oh, by the way, that Colonel Nichols is the one that went uh, oh, yes. up to Under Secretary Bell to get that treasury to donate that that silver, and and he did tell him <laughs> about the troy ounces. And, and oh, by the way, everyone makes the same mistake, so please do not feel bad about this. But the silver came from the West Point Depository in New oh, York. Gold oh. is in Fort Knox. <laughs> ah. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, that's very interesting. I assumed they were both in the same place, but that wouldn't make sense, would it? No, no, they wouldn't. It's in the it was, uh, silver's kept in uh, West Point Depository in New York. They tell me that that silver that was loaned to the Manhattan Project is still in reserve. Has not some of it, at least, has not been used. I would really love to get a hold of just a little bit of that. Oh, yes. and get it back down to Oak Ridge again. <laughs> and another thing, I told you about building 9731. The, 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 it was the pilot building at Y-12, and it had two alpha calutrons and two beta calutrons. And, and they kept that operating up until 1970, and actually until 74. But in 1970, they shut down the alpha calutron and took 64 tons of silver out of it and returned it to the treasury. Now, all those years from 1943 until 1970, each year they would write a letter to the treasury department and say, we cannot give you that silver back. We, we are going to keep it because it's too important. Now, what they were doing is they were separating all of the elements in the periodic table, getting those stable isotopes out. Some of them were going over to the graphite reactor being made into radioisotopes for nuclear medicine. And of yeah. course, the building you went through, Beta 3, building 9204-3, where the beta calutrons were, those operated until 1998, separating those stable isotopes as well. So right. that, that's the rest of the story. That's Richard, wonderful. You, you have, you, Richard, do you have more? more stories about your time in Oak Ridge? Well, I have one more and I, I will share it and then we'll, we'll get it straightened out. <laughs> because <laughs> obviously, <laughs> now I'm delighted. I'm always glad to get the, the story straight. <laughs> I don't <laughs> either. Listen, I understand completely. <laughs> one, of the, one of the experiences of interviewing all of the scientists who worked on the Manhattan Project it, late in their lives, right, by the 1970s, was that they almost never had their facts straight. <laughs> when I would then go to the original documents, I would straighten it all out. And, and some of them later on said of the making of the atomic bomb, my book that Rhodes finally got the information there that we needed to tell our stories. So you're just carrying on that tradition, which is wonderful. We really should keep things as straight as we can. We do all we can and then we still can't keep it straight. <laughs> no, I know. It all turns into myth eventually. Yeah. Uh, the other story that I remember, and you'll have to see if this makes sense. Mm -hmm. My guide took me to what looked like a little farm out somewhere on the Oak Ridge Reservation. There was a what looked like a silo yes. and, a, and a farmhouse. Yes, yes. And there was something dug into the hillside across the road. and. He yeah. explained to me that this this was a fake farm. Yes, that, that silo was in fact a machine gun emplacement. <laughs> that, that, I think the, that, right, the farm building was where the guards stayed when they weren't on duty or yeah. something like that. But most importantly, there was a full scale bank safe yeah. dug into the hillside on the other side of the road, completely surrounded with walkways, mm -hmm. and it was in that bank safe, as I understood it, that. The, the day or weeks or whatever production of, of highly enriched uranium was stored pending its being delivered uh, down to Los Alamos, mm -hmm. which struck me as a, a wonderful example of Groves's meticulous care for what he was doing. And I mean, having a bank safe suspended in the middle of a space 
in a cave, basically, yes, and having a machine gun tower next door just was a little chilling and a little impressive. Yeah. Well, you have to remember, they were a bit paranoid back then. They had this new material, and they were afraid that, that someone was going to get it, that, uh, that somebody was going to fly in. I mean, they, you know, they, they cited the Manhattan Project in, uh, in Tennessee partially because it was inland from the sea enough, they thought, to protect it. Now, let me add a little more to that little story you introduced there. Good. That silo is still there today. Ah. That building, now the silo doesn't, it's just a, a, a tall cylindrical structure now. The building that used to look like the barn, all of that barn part has been taken off and it's just now blue sheet metal. Mm -hmm. But now that thing has a history. When it started, they called it Operation Dog. Now, I don't have a clue why I don't make any connection, but that is why they kept the highly enriched uranium. Now, they didn't use it very long, but they did. They kept it there for a while. And then in later years, they actually just kept it over near the Calutrons. But yeah. it started out as Operation Dog. I've been in that vault. I know that door you're talking about. <clears throat> and the thing is that after it, it was no longer being used for its intended purpose, it was a, a place that a, a an organization at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory uh, decided to use it. And they just put their offices out there. Now it's a real nice location out in the woods. It's just a beautiful place. And the secretary for that division was named Katie Odom. And Katie used to have her lunch out there and she would feed all of the people out on picnic tables out in those woods, just a beautiful setting. So they started calling that place Katie's Kitchen. <laughs> now that's the name that it's known by now is Katie's Kitchen. Uh, a few years ago, we wrote a book, a cookbook about uh, recipes from people at, the, at Oak Ridge. And we named that cookbook Katie's Kitchen Cookbook. And we went and found Katie Odom and brought her back and had her autograph that book. All the proceeds went to the United Way. And then we wrote stories about her. And, and that tradition of that building is now Katie's Kitchen. And everyone knows about Katie's Kitchen. But mostly they don't know yeah. the original intent and use of the building. And the Tennessee Wildlife and Resource Agency uh, are using it now and, and they store their documents in that, uh, in that vault. <laughs> it's that interesting. That's amazing. Uh, well, you know, the first time I visited Rome, I, I realized that if you go to where the uh, Roman Forum was, mm -hmm. it's all well below grade because of course cities pile up as as the centuries go on and in a way so does history here is all this new layer on top of the old one with all sorts of interesting quirks involved so one of the things i love is is tracking back to these earlier things and seeing what was there before and here is a good example it is yeah, yeah that's right that's an excellent example <laughs> well those are the stories that i remember from my visits to to oak ridge now let, let me ask you another from another perspective as you were researching that manhattan project uh book and, and actually i think you've written uh, a couple of books that relate to it when you were looking at the Oak Ridge involvement in the Manhattan Project, what was your impression about the importance of the three sites, Oak Ridge, Los Alamos, Hanford, Washington? How did they stack up in, uh, in what was going on in Grove's mind? You know, one of the things that I like to say these days when I'm lecturing on this subject is that the Manhattan Project is fading into myth. Yeah. And eventually, I'm afraid it's going to be one man, Robert Oppenheimer, mm -hmm. who already is listed even by people who should know better as the man who ran the Manhattan Project, which of course he didn't, General Crowds did. Uh, one place, Los Alamos, and one bomb, Hiroshima. 
And of course it was far more complicated. And, and indeed, I think Oak Ridge was the central location. If by that, I mean, plutonium came along a little bit later. It was not at all clear if that technology was going to work until they actually ran the, the uh, first CP1 operation in Chicago in 42. Before that, it was uranium. And, and the uranium problem was a huge problem because of separating U-235 basically from U-238 and, and hence all these immense factories. I, I don't think people realize, but if, as I recall the story, someone picked up a little briefcase with the week's production of, of critical material <laughs> from these giant machines and took it by train to Chicago where it was passed to someone else and he took it to Los Alamos. But that's how little material came out of all this production week by week. And it was a very near thing ultimately, whether we were even going to have more than one bomb by the end of the war. So Oak Ridge was clearly a very central part, more in my mind than, I mean, to, even to this day, anyone can find bomb designs these days on the internet. It's not a question of knowing the design. It's a question of having the crucial materials. And without that, all the bomb designs in the world won't do you any good. So it's very important that the work that was done at Oak Ridge. And that's the reason that Iran is, I mean, we keep, we keep such an eye on Iran and, and Korea is, you know, they're enriching uranium, uh, trying to enrich uranium to bomb grade material. So exactly, you know, exactly. So you're we know they've right. got the bomb designs. Yeah, sure. That was determined a decade ago. So yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, something related to that. Oh, forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> well, it'll come back, I'm sure. Yeah, it'll it'll come back around. Eh? No question. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so although. Clearly, Hanford was a very important part of the operation. Uh, Oak Ridge comes first. Mm -hmm. and, and Los Alamos then becomes kind of the finishing operation, important as that was and complicated. As, although I don't think the little boy bomb was terribly complicated. I remember talking to Robert Serber, Bob Serber, who, was, who designed the little boy bomb. He had, there was a famous conference at uh, Berkeley in the summer of 42, when they all, the physicists all got together to put together in one place everything they knew at that point. And in fact, it was out of that that the first uh, Los Alamos lectures were given that became the Los Alamos primer. So in 42, Server told me, he said, we only spent one day talking about the, the, the gun bomb design. And then they moved on to talking about, about the hydrogen bombs. <laughs> he said, they just, Oppenheimer just said to me, okay, you can design this, Bob, let's get this out of the way. We've got this other idea we want to play with. Mm -hmm. The reason they were talking about uh, thermonuclears was because they weren't sure there was going to be enough material for uh, uranium and plutonium by the end of the war for, for the bombs. And they were hoping that there would be some way that they could use a smaller amount to set off a hydrogen reaction. So it wasn't entirely frivolous, but, but its server said, so I had to go off and design. And of course the little boy was never tested, of course, at full yield. There wasn't enough uranium around to do that. Mm -hmm. And it really wasn't necessarily anyway, because they tested at, at uh, basically zero yield in various ways, experimentally in the laboratory. So they knew the bomb was going to work. Yeah. Plus I think it had three or four critical masses in it and a large amount of enriched uranium from Oak Ridge that, <laughs> that meant that if they could just get the two parts in one place, it would surely go off. Uh, you're right, there, there was uh, never any doubt that that bomb would work. All right. you had to do was to bring the two parts in close proximity. Exactly. The problem, the problem you, as you know, that developed, there was another bomb plan called Thin Man yes. that they were going to use the plutonium to do the same thing. And it 
pre-ignited. They, they could not get it to stay in movement until it could get like the uranium would work, but the plutonium wouldn't. And obviously I'm not smart enough to know all the reasons why that happened, but mm -hmm. they did know that the uranium bomb without yeah. a doubt would work. And so they didn't test it. Now, Oak Ridge created in, in about a year, year and a half. I remember they had a total of 1,152 calutrons, 22,482 people working there at Y12 for over a year to produce about 65 kilograms of highly enriched uranium, U-235. And you're right, they took it out in briefcase and small <laughs> Coffee cup size, gold line gold, containers. Gold line containers had two of them in a briefcase, and then the, <laughs> the brief the uh, the army soldier would uh, put on plain clothes and have that briefcase chained to his wrist, and had a couple of others that went with him to keep an eye on him, yeah. to make sure he uh, he was able to do what he wanted to do. You know, yeah. while you were talking a while ago about the different kinds of bombs, I've got a I've got a real quick story that I want to tell. Um, talking about the thermonuclear bomb. Um, I interviewed a, a, a fella. He was a young physicist when he first came to Oak Ridge. And um, he, his job, um, he said the question that he had, and he spent about a year, uh, a small team spent about a year, year and a half on this project. The question was, if you exploded a thermonuclear weapon in the atmosphere, would the atmosphere catch on fire and burn up? And he, as he was telling me that, he said, because you only do that once. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, uh, at, the end of his, at the end of his work, you know, his, his question was, we're pretty sure that it won't, that, that won't happen. <laughs> uh, Actually, that was one of the issues that was discussed at this meeting at Berkeley in the summer of 42. Yeah. Edward Keller brought up the question and Hans Beta uh, worked the numbers and explained to me later, Beta said, you know, the reason the atmosphere wouldn't ignite is the same reason that Edward Teller's thermonuclear weapon design never worked because, <laughs> because it cooled off too fast at the edges, he said meaning you had to compress the hydrogen in order to get the kind of density that you needed. And if something's exploding in the open air, it, it, it goes the other way, it, it yeah. decompresses. So, so it was, Teller's design was, was as wrong as this atmospheric <laughs> explosion question, but they did have to consider it. Yeah. And, and there were jokes about it. You know, Fermi collected some bets on the subject later on at, at, uh, in, uh, at the Trinity site when they were testing the first implosion bomb. Yeah. Fermi took bets not only on the yield of this bomb, but also on whether it would ignite the atmosphere, wow. which made everybody a little nervous. Um, yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. So the rest, the rest of that story is that that man that Keith was talking about was Alex Zucker. He actually eventually was a uh, associate director of the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. And uh, he did that experiment on the calutrons in beta three. That part of his experiment is still out there in those calutrons. We have a portion of his uh, power supply that was used to generate what was needed, the apparatus needed to, uh, to run that test. We still have that. Uh, on display out there in Beta 3 today. So that story about uh, Alex Zucker is, is a part of the Manhattan Project National Historical Park. Have you ever thought of writing all these memories that you have stored away, writing them down? I have, and as a matter of fact, I do, I do that. I write an article every week in the local Oak Ridger. And for, I've been doing it now for about 15 years. And uh, each year at the end of the year, I pull all of those articles together and put them into a book. So Good. I've published a number of books. And I try to get all of these stories, like the ones we're talking about here, in some way included. Now, I worked at Y12 for 47 years plus, 
And the last 10 years, I was their official historian. And I wrote an article each week about the history of Y-12. Now I have all of those and I wrote most of them in, uh, in chronological order. Yeah. So I have them. And again, that now that I'm retired, got all the time in the world, as you know, <laughs> <laughs> I pull those together and produce a book on the history of Y-12. So Great. I appreciate Great. you bringing that up and giving me an opportunity to plug the fact that we're doing it. <laughs> That's wonderful. I'm really glad those things should not be lost. I agree. Otherwise, you'll end up with Los Alamos was the only place any of this work was done. And that's not fair. You know, when when <laughs> Ray, you know. mentioned, Ray mentioned, you know, when we first started that I had done several films on Oak Ridge history. And when the first one the, came out in uh, that, that talked, that's called The War Years, Secret City, The War Years, um, about the Manhattan Project years in Oak Ridge. And when I put together kind of an advisory committee of folks to, to make sure that I was telling an accurate story and to, to point me in the right direction on, on certain things, the, the biggest thing that I came from, uh, came away with was that Los Alamos always got the glory. Oh, and God. when you when they talk it when the history channel does something on the manhattan project it's los alamos okay and oak ridge may be mentioned but it never got the credit that it was due and so that first that first film that i made that first documentary that i made was just about oak ridge's uh role in the manhattan project and uh so so i, I think people were glad when that came out because it was finally being able to tell that story in a visual way uh, where, you know, people could see it. So good. Good. So is there a comparable film about Hanford? Ray, I don't know. Uh, there have been some, there have been some films made at Hanford short ones, but I'm not aware of anything comparable to the 90 minute war, war years that Keith produced and also so he produced one that's 1945 to 2006, uh -huh. which is the second 90 minute. Yeah. Uh, of yeah. course, it has to cover so much that it it's a very right. high level coverage where the war years goes into into more in depth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, but uh, well, no, I'm not aware that there's anything of this quality been produced uh, at uh, at Hanford. You know, by the way, that, that you know, by the way, that when they finally found uh, Saddam Hussein's plans, yes, they had been working with, weren't they working on Calutrons? They were exactly. And the person yeah. that identified those plans uh, was Dr. Uh, John Guggen, who was a scientist at Y 12. They brought him some aerial photographs and he pointed to them and he said, He's building a little Y-12 here, here, and here. So they went and, and, and put rockets in, blew those places up. And right. then ground troops went in. When the ground troops went in, they actually found drawings of Y-12 that was there. So yes, Saddam was building little Y-12. Wow. Well, I talked to, I talked to uh, David Kay and Bob Gallucci, the guys who were running the inspection teams that went into Iraq after the war. And they had some wonderful stories to tell, but one of them was David Case said, you know, in order to explain to our team what a Calutron was, because they had yeah. no idea, right? They, they knew centrifuges. Right. He said, I happen to have my copy of the making of the atomic bomb with me. So I showed them the diagram in that book. <laughs> So it really was a surprise to everyone because it was by then an open technology. It was no longer classified. And no. therefore the Iraqis engineers could, could go to a library in Switzerland or somewhere and find, find the plants, which is so, what they did. So I, I do tours of Oak Ridge constantly and, and do give talks about Oak Ridge. And I found a little story that I use to explain how Calutron works. And I'm going to share it with you now. It's just a fun little thing I do. And you'll be amazed that the entire audience will grasp the concept. 
So I talk about it this way. I say, if I had my hand holding up here and I took two rubber bands and held it down from my hand and on the bottom of the rubber bands, I put a golf ball on one and a ping pong ball on the other. Then I held it up to my side and I spun it real quick for a half a turn, that golf ball would stretch that rubber band further than the ping pong ball. So if I caught it up at the top, I could catch the, the ping pong ball or the, or the golf ball. And the golf ball would make a slightly larger arc than the ping pong ball because it's heavier and centrifugal force would do it. The same thing happens in the calutron with uranium 238 and 235. 238 is three neutrons heavier than the 235. So when it goes in between those magnets, gets bent, centrifugal force will make the 238 make a slightly larger arc than the 235. So you can catch that 235 up at the top. But I said, the problem is in a thousand pounds of uranium ore, there's only seven pounds of uranium-235. Now you'd be amazed, that simple little illustration, everybody gets it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And Bill, Bill Wilcox, he, he, he liked to say uh, the difference in weight between uh, U-235 and U-238 is uh, you take two basketballs and then you tape a nickel to one of them. And he said that was the difference in the weight. So, yeah, that's great. Uh, that's very helpful. I wish I'd had these things when I was writing these books. <laughs> uh, speaking of writing, tell us about, tell, tell us uh, our, 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 our viewers uh, about some of your other books. Well, besides the further three volumes on the nuclear age, yeah. and I would mention in that uh, specifically the, the summit at Reykjavik, Iceland, in October of 1986 between Ronald Reagan and the, uh, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, when those two men, both kind of outsiders compared to the, to the standard issue politicians of the day, mm -hmm. came within a hair's breadth of agreeing to begin working toward the elimination of all the nuclear weapons in the world. I was so drawn to this that I got my hands on the transcripts, both in Russian and in English from the American and the Russian side and turned them into a play. Uh, it's called Reykjavik and it's had readings all over the country, but it's going to be produced in Washington by the Tonic Theater there next spring, yeah. either on stage if we're all finally able to go back to normal or if not, it will be streamed online. But it's a, it was really fun to take these two transcripts and work them into a dramatic play between these two mm. people. It was an inherently dramatic event. To me, that was one of the highlights of all my personal experience with all of this. I will say one story, and that is, I. I wanted to add something that would kind of lighten the story a little bit because there's an awful lot of discussion between these two world leaders about throw weights and different kinds of intermediate range, long range uh, missiles that can get a little tedious. So I, I have Reagan teach Gorbachev how to do a soft shoe. <laughs> this needless to say is a very popular scene with audiences. <laughs> and and it's, it's, although it's fictional, it's, it's consistent with who Reagan was and the kind of person he was. And it's consistent with Gorbachev's being a kind of an adventurer. So, right, so that's right. something that came out of all of this. I just finished a book, literally finished it. I'm still going over the, 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 the manuscript on my desk right now on a totally different subject, but one that I think anyone who's interested in science will find fascinating. And that's a biography of the, uh, 20th century biologist and, and myrmecologist, Edward O. Wilson, E. O. Wilson, who's probably the world's leading expert on ants, and who is the guy who figured out how ants communicate with each other, and even found ways to talk to ants using the same chemical uh, pheromones that ants use to lay their trails and so forth. It's a different kind of science. And I must tell you, I prefer physics to biology. <laughs> <laughs> At least physics by and large is in English instead of Latin. Right. 
<laughs> but uh, that book will be out in late October from Doubleday. It's called simply Scientist, Edward O. Wilson, A Life in Nature. And I think, I think people will find it a fascinating read. Well, thank you. He's, so. by the way, a Southerner. He's from Alabama. So he's from your neck of the woods mm -hmm. and was kind of a barefoot boy when he grew up and loved going into the woods and finding bugs and turned it into, into one, of the, one of the really great scientific careers of, of the last 50 years. Wow. So I've kind of been all over the place, but I really stopped writing about nuclear issues basically because I brought the subject up to the present and ran out of history. So Sure, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Which is which which is a good thing. Yes. I, yeah, which is so a good have thing. to live through another 10 years of nuclear history before I can write another book yeah. on the subject. <laughs> absolutely. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, oh, my pleasure. Thank yeah, you. Absolutely. It's a, it was a real honor for me and honor uh, for Ray and I to have you uh, on our podcast here. You bet. We really appreciate you taking the time to do this. Sure. Well, listen, I've learned a lot today, Ray. Thank you so much. Oh. <laughs> All did, right. I'm just a storyteller. <laughs> yeah. <we're> just... <laughs> so am I. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all so much. And folks, thanks for, thanks for uh, tuning in. Ray, we've got, uh, who do we have scheduled for next time in a couple of weeks? Yeah, now we, we, as you say, we do this every two weeks. And interestingly enough, uh, I've been talking with Stan Norris. Uh, Dick, you know him. And he wrote the book Racing for the Bomb. And, and he's what we consider, I, I know you agree with me, Dick, he's done more research on General Groves than any other person uh, uh, that, we, that we know. And, and I'm just so glad that he has agreed to be uh, our guest on our next uh, Hidden History. Now, I'm going to give a little plug for a little further. Just a week or so ago, I was fortunate enough to be asked to give a tour to Alexia Dmitrieva. Now, I know I'm not saying that right. Yeah, me, yeah, he's yeah, he's sure. a Russian and yeah. he's a travel writer. And he came to, uh, to Oak Ridge and asked for a tour. I gave him a tour. Of all of the things that I showed him and we talked about, he was most impressed by our international friendship bell. He really liked that bell. And, and I found that interesting, but in the course of our conversation, he asked me if there was ever any spies in Oak Ridge <laughs> during the Manhattan Project. And of course I told him, yes, I've written about three that were here. And one of those three that were here is uh, George Koval. And yes. you know about him, how yeah. Putin gave him a, a high honor posthumously, but gave him a high honor just a few years ago. Right. And uh, now, Alexia is doing research from the Russian archives, Good. George Koval. So we're going to collaborate and provide some additional information about what he can learn about that spy. So that'll be a month from now, four weeks from now. But uh, the next time we'll talk to Stan and then we'll talk to Alexia. So I'm looking is forward, Keith, to the coming months because you really got us off to a good start for 2021 by agreeing to be our first guest this yeah. year. Well, it's my honor, believe me. Thank you so much. Those are going to be two fascinating programs. Stan will speak to Grove's importance to the whole project. He and will. I'm fascinated to hear what, what Koval finds, what, what Dimitriev finds out about Koval. Yeah. yeah. All right. Very good. Well, thank you, Ray. Thank you, Ray. Yeah. We appreciate Thank it, y'all. All right. And folks, thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.